The Mysteries of Udolpho by Anne Radcliffe. Reading and musical selections performed by Cara Dahl Russell. Volume 2, Chapter 2. Quote, Titania. If you will patiently dance in our round and see our moonlight revels, go with us. End quote. A Midsummer Night's Dream. Early on the following morning, the travelers set out for Turin. The luxuriant plain that extends from the feet of the Alps to that magnificent city was not then, as now, shaded by an avenue of trees nine miles in length, but plantations of olives, mulberry, and palms, festooned with vines, mingled with the pastoral scenery, through with the rapid Po after its descent from the mountains, wandered to meet the humble Doria at Turin. As they advanced towards this city, the Alps, seen at some distance, began to appear in all their awful sublimity, chain rising over chain in long succession, their higher points darkened by the hovering clouds, sometimes hid, and at others seen shooting up far above them, while the lower steps, broken into fantastic forms, were touched with blue and purplish tints, which, as they changed in light and shade, seemed to open new scenes to the eye. To the east stretched the plains of Lombardy, with the towers of Turin rising at a distance, and beyond, the Apennines, bounding the horizon. The general magnificence of that city, with its vistas of churches and palaces branching from the grand square, each opening to a landscape of the distant Alps or Apennines, was not only such as Emily had never seen in France, but such as she had never imagined. Montoni, who had been often at Turin and cared little about views of any kind, did not comply with his wife's request that they might survey some of the palaces. But staying only till the necessary refreshments could be obtained, they set forward for Venice with all possible rapidity. Montoni's manner during this journey was grave and even haughty, and towards Madame Montoni he was more especially reserved. But it was not the reserve of respect so much as of pride and discontent. Of Emily, he took little notice. With Cavigny, his conversations were commonly on political or military topics, such as the convulsed state of their country rendered at this time particularly interesting. Emily observed that, at the mention of any daring exploit, Montoni's eyes lost their sullenness and seemed instantaneously to gleam with fire, yet they still retained somewhat of a lurking cunning and she sometimes thought that their fire partook more of the glare of malice than the brightness of valor, though the latter would well have harmonized with the high chivalric air of his figure, in which Cavigny, with all his gay and gallant manners, was his inferior. On entering the Milanese, the gentlemen exchanged their French hats for the Italian cap of scarlet cloth, embroidered, and Emily was somewhat surprised to observe that Montoni added to his the military plume, while Cavigny retained only the feather, which was usually worn with such caps. But she at length concluded that Montoni assumed this ensign of a soldier for convenience, as a means of passing with more safety through a country overrun with parties of the military. Over the beautiful plains of this country the devastations of war were frequently visible where the lands had not been suffered to lie uncultivated, they were often tracked with the steps of the spoiler, 
The vines were torn down from the branches that had supported them, the olives trampled upon the ground, and even the groves of mulberry trees had been hewn by the enemy to light fires that destroyed the hamlets and villages of their owners. Emily turned her eyes with a sigh from these painful vestiges of contention to the Alps of the Grisson that overlooked them to the north, whose awful solitudes seemed to offer to persecuted man a secure asylum. The travelers frequently distinguished troops of soldiers moving at a distance, and they experienced at the little inns on the road the scarcity of provision and other inconveniences which are part of the consequence of intestine war. But they had never reason to be much alarmed for their immediate safety, and they passed on to Milan with little interruption of any kind, where they stayed not to survey the grandeur of the city, or even to view its vast cathedral, which was then building. Beyond Milan, the country wore the aspect of a ruder devastation, and though everything seemed now quiet, the repose was like that of death, spread over features which retained the impression of the last convulsions. It was not till they had passed the eastern limits of the Milanese that the travellers saw any troops since they had left Milan when, as the evening was drawing to a close, they described what appeared to be an army winding onward along the distant plains, whose spears and other arms caught the last rays of the sun. As the column advanced through a part of the road contracted between two hillocks, some of the commanders on horseback were distinguished on a small eminence, pointing and making signals for the march, while several of the officers were riding along the line directing its progress according to the signs communicated by those above, and others, separating from the vanguard, which had emerged from the pass, were riding carelessly along the plains at some distance to the right of the army. As they drew nearer, Montoni, distinguishing the feathers that waved in their caps and the banners and liveries of the bands that followed them, thought he knew this to be the small army commanded by the famous Captain Utaldo, with whom, as well as some of the other chiefs, he was personally acquainted. He, therefore, gave orders that the carriages should draw up by the side of the road to await their arrival and give them the pass. A faint strain of martial music now stole by, and gradually strengthening as the troops approached, Emily distinguished the drums and trumpets with the clash of cymbals and of arms that were struck by a party in time to the march. Montoni, being now certain that these were the bands of the victorious Utaldo, leaned from the carriage window and hailed their general by waving his cap in the air, which compliment the chief returned by raising his spear and then letting it down again suddenly, while some of his officers, who were riding at a distance from the troops, came up to the carriage and saluted Montoni as an old acquaintance. The captain himself soon after arriving, his bands halted while he conversed with Montoni, whom he appeared much rejoiced to see, and from what he said, Emily understood that this was a victorious army, returning into their own principality, while the numerous wagons that accompanied them contained the rich spoils of the enemy, their own wounded soldiers, and the prisoners they had taken in battle, who were to be ransomed when the peace then negotiating between the neighboring states, should be ratified. The chiefs on the following day were to separate, and each, taking his share of the spoil, was to return with his own band to his castle. This was, therefore, to be an evening of uncommon and general festivity, in commemoration of the victory that they had accomplished together, and of the farewell which the commanders were about to take of each other. Emily, as these officers conversed with Montoni, observed with admiration, tinctured with awe, their high martial air, mingled with the haughtiness of the noblesse of those days, and heightened by the gallantry of their dress, 
by the plumes towering on their caps, the armorial coat, Persian sash, and ancient Spanish cloak. Utaldo, telling Montoni that his army were going to encamp for the night near a village at only a few miles' distance, invited him to turn back and partake of their festivity, assuring the ladies also that they should be pleasantly accommodated. But Montoni excused himself, adding that it was his design to reach Verona that evening, and, after some conversation concerning the state of the country towards that city, they parted. The travellers proceeded without any interruption, but it was some hours after sunset before they arrived at Verona, whose beautiful environs were therefore not seen by Emily till the following morning, when, leaving that pleasant town at an early hour, they set off for Padua, where they embarked on the Brenta for Venice. Here the scene was entirely changed. No vestiges of war such as had deformed the plains of the Milanese appeared. On the contrary, all was peace and elegance. The verdant banks of the Brenta exhibited a continued landscape of beauty, gaiety, and splendor. Emily gazed with admiration on the villas of the Venetian noblesse, with their cool porticos and colonnades overhung with poplars and cypresses of majestic height and lively verdure, on their rich orangeries, whose blossoms perfumed the air, and on the luxuriant willows that dipped their light leaves in the wave and sheltered from the sun the gay parties whose music came at intervals on the breeze. The carnival did indeed appear to extend from Venice along the whole line of these enchanting shores. The river was gay with boats passing to that city, exhibiting the fantastic diversity of a masquerade in the dresses of the people within them, and towards evening groups of dancers frequently were seen beneath the trees. <laughs> Cavigni, meanwhile, informed her of the names of the noblemen to whom the several villas they passed belonged, adding light sketches of their characters, such as served to amuse rather than to inform, exhibiting his own wit instead of the delineation of truth. Emily was sometimes diverted by his conversation, but his gaiety did not entertain Madame Montoni, as it had formerly done. She was frequently grave and Montoni retained his unusual reserve. Nothing could exceed Emily's admiration on her first view of Venice, with its islets, palaces, and towers rising out of the sea, whose clear surface reflected the tremulous picture in all its colors. The sun, sinking in the west, tinted the waves and the lofty mountains of Friuli, which skirted the northern shores of the Adriatic, with a saffron glow, while on the marble porticos and colonnades of St. Mark were thrown the rich lights and shades of evening. As they glided on, the grander features of this city appeared more distinctly. Its terraces, crowned with airy yet majestic fabrics, touched as they now were with the splendor of the setting sun, appeared as if they had been called up from the ocean by the wand of an enchanter rather than reared by mortal hands. The sun, soon after sinking to the lower world, the shadow of the earth stole gradually over the waves and then up the towering sides of the mountains of Friuli, till it extinguished even the last upward beams that had lingered on their summits, 
and the melancholy purple of evening drew over them like a thin veil. How deep, how beautiful was the tranquility that wrapped this scene. All nature seemed to repose. The finest emotions of the soul were alone awake. Emily's eyes filled with tears of admiration and sublime devotion as she raised them over the sleeping world to the vast heavens and heard the notes of solemn music that stole over the waters from a distance. She listened in still rapture, and no person of the party broke the charm by an inquiry. The sounds seemed to grow on the air, for so smoothly did the barge glide along that its motion was not perceivable, and the fairy city appeared approaching to welcome the strangers. They now distinguished a female voice, accompanied by a few instruments, singing a soft and mournful air, and its fine expression, as sometimes it seemed pleading with the impassioned tenderness of love, and then languishing into the cadence of hopeless grief, declared that it flowed from no feigned sensibility. Ah, thought Emily, as she sighed and remembered Valancourt, those strains come from the heart. She looked around with anxious inquiry. The deep twilight that had fallen over the scene admitted only imperfect images to the eye, but at some distance on the sea, she thought she perceived a gondola. A chorus of voices and instruments now swelled on the air, so sweet, so solemn, it seemed like the hymn of angels descending through the silence of the night. Now it died away, and fancy almost beheld the holy choir reascending towards heaven. Then again it swelled with the breeze, trembled a while, and again died into silence. It brought to Emily's recollection some lines of her late father, and she repeated in a low voice, Oft I hear, upon the silence of the midnight air, celestial voices swell in holy chorus that bears the soul to heaven. stillness that succeeded was as expressive as the strain that had just ceased. It was uninterrupted for several minutes, till a general sigh seemed to release the company from their enchantment. Emily, however, long indulged the pleasing sadness that had stolen upon her spirits, but the gay and busy scene that appeared as the barge approached St. Mark's Place at length roused her attention. The rising moon, which threw a shadowy light on the terraces and illuminated the porticos and magnificent arcades that crowned them, discovered the various company, whose light steps, soft guitars, and softer voices echoed through the colonnades. The music they heard before now passed Montoni's barge in one of the gondolas, of which several were seen skimming along the moonlight sea, full of gay parties catching the cool breeze. Most of these had music, made sweeter by the waves over which it floated, and by the measured sound of oars as they dashed the sparkling tide. Emily gazed and listened, and thought herself in a fairy scene. Even Madame Montoni was pleased. Montoni congratulated himself on his return to Venice, which he called the first city in the world, and Cavigny was more gay and animated than ever. The barge passed on to the Grand Canal, where Montoni's mansion was situated, and here other forms of beauty and of grandeur, such as her imagination had never painted, were unfolded to Emily in the palaces of Sansovino and Palladio as she glided along the waves. The air bore no sounds but those of sweetness, echoing along the margin of the canal and from gondolas on its surface while groups of masks were seen dancing on the moonlight terraces 
and seemed almost to realize the romance of fairyland. The barge stopped before the portico of a large house, from whence a servant of Montoni crossed the terrace, and immediately the party disembarked. From the portico they passed a noble hall to a staircase of marble, which led to a saloon fitted up in a style of magnificence that surprised Emily. The walls and ceilings were adorned with historical and allegorical paintings in fresco, Silver tripods, depending from chains of the same metal, illumined the apartment, the floor of which was covered with Indian mats, painted in a variety of colors and devices. The couches and drapery of the lattices were of pale green silk, embroidered and fringed with green and gold. Balcony lattices opened upon the Grand Canal, whence rose a confusion of voices and musical instruments, and the breeze that gave freshness to the apartment. Emily, considering the gloomy temper of Montoni, looked upon the splendid furniture of this house with surprise, and remembered the report of his being a man of broken fortune with astonishment. Ah, she said to herself, if Valancourt could but see this mansion, what peace it would give him, he would then be convinced the report was groundless. Madame Montoni seemed to assume the air of a princess, but Montoni was restless and discontented and did not even observe the civility of bidding her welcome to her home. Soon after his arrival, he ordered his gondola and with Cavigny went out to mingle in the scenes of the evening. Madame then became serious and thoughtful. Emily, who was charmed with everything she saw, endeavored to enliven her but reflection had not with Madame Montoni subdued caprice and ill-humour, and her answers discovered so much of both that Emily gave up the attempt of diverting her and withdrew to a lattice to amuse herself with a scene without, so new and so enchanting. The first object that attracted her notice was a group of dancers on the terrace below, led by a guitar and some other instruments. The girl who struck the guitar and another who flourished a tambourine passed on in a dancing step and with a light grace and gaiety of heart that would have subdued the goddess of spleen in her worst humor. After these came a group of fantastic figures, some dressed as gondolieri, others as minstrels, while others seemed to defy all description. They sung in parts, their voices accompanied by a few soft instruments. At a little distance from the portico they stopped, and Emily distinguished the verses of Ariosto. They sung of the wars of the Moors against Charlemagne, and then of the woes of Orlando. Afterwards the measure changed, and the melancholy sweetness of Petrarch succeeded. The magic of his grief was assisted by all that Italian music and Italian expression, heightened by the enchantments of Venetian moonlight, could give. Emily, as she listened, caught the pensive enthusiasm. Her tears flowed silently while her fancy bore her far away to France and to Valancourt. Each succeeding sonnet, more full of charming sadness than the last, seemed to bind the spell of melancholy. With extreme regret, she saw the musicians move on, and her attention followed the strain till the last faint warble died in air. She then remained sunk in that pensive tranquility which soft music leaves on the mind. A state like that produced by the view of a beautiful landscape by moonlight, or by the recollection of scenes marked with the tenderness of friends lost forever, and with sorrows 
which time have mellowed into mild regret. Such scenes are indeed to the mind like, quote, those faint traces which the memory bears of music that is past, end quote. Other sounds soon awakened her attention. It was the solemn harmony of horns that swelled from a distance. And observing the gondolas arrange themselves along the margin of the terraces, she threw on her veil, and stepping into the balcony, discerned, in the distant perspective of the canal, something like a procession, floating on the light surface of the water. As it approached, the horns and other instruments mingled sweetly, and soon after the fabled deities of the city seemed to have arisen from the ocean. For Neptune, with Venice personified as his queen, came on the undulating waves, surrounded by tritons and sea nymphs. The fantastic splendor of this spectacle, together with the grandeur of the surrounding palaces, appeared like the vision of a poet suddenly embodied, and the fanciful images which it awakened in Emily's mind lingered there long after the procession had passed away. She indulged herself in imagining what might be the manners and delights of a sea nymph, till she almost wished to throw off the habit of mortality and plunge into the green wave to participate them. How delightful, said she, to live amidst the coral bowers and crystal caverns of the ocean with my sister nymphs and listen to the sounding waters above, and to the soft shells of the tritons, and then, after sunset, to skim on the surface of the waves round wild rocks and along sequestered shores where, perhaps, some pensive wanderer comes to weep. Then would I soothe his sorrows with my sweet music, and offer him from a shell some of the delicious fruit that hangs around Neptune's palace." She was called from her reverie to a mere mortal supper, and could not forbear smiling at the fancy she had been indulging, and at her conviction of the serious displeasure which Madame Montoni would have expressed could she have been made acquainted with them. After supper, her aunt sat late, but Montoni did not return, and she at length retired to rest. If Emily had admired the magnificence of the saloon, she was not less surprised on observing the half-finished and forlorn appearance of the apartments she passed in the way to her chamber, whither she went through long suites of noble rooms that seemed, from their desolate aspect, to have been unoccupied for many years. On the walls of some were faded remains of tapestry, from others painted in fresco, the damps had almost withdrawn both colors and design. At length she reached her own chamber. Spacious, desolate, and lofty, like the rest, with high lattices that opened toward the Adriatic. It brought gloomy images to her mind. But the view of the Adriatic soon gave her others more airy, among which was that of the sea nymph, whose delights she had before amused herself with picturing. And, anxious to escape from serious reflections, she now endeavored to throw her fanciful ideas into a train, and concluded the hour with composing the following lines. The Sea Nymph Down, down a thousand fathom deep Among the sounding seas I go Play round the foot of every steep Whose cliffs above the ocean grow There within their secret cares I hear the mighty rivers roar 
and guide their streams through Neptune's waves to bless the green earth's inmost shore. And bid the freshened waters glide for fern-crowned nymphs of lake or brook through winding woods and pastures wide and many a wild romantic nook. For this the nymphs at fall of eve off dance upon the flowery banks and sing my name, and garlands weave to bear beneath the wave their thanks. In coral bowers I love to lie, and hear the surges roll above, and through the water's view on high the proud ships sail and gay clouds move. And oft, at midnight's stillest hour, when summer sees the vessel lave, I love to prove my charmful power while floating on the moonlight wave. And when deep sleep the crew has bound, and the sad lover musing leans o'er the ship's side, I breathe around such strains as speak no mortal means. O'er the dim waves his searching eye sees but the vessel's lengthened shade, above the moon and azure sky, entranced he hears, and half afraid, Sometimes a single note I swell, that softly sweet at distance dies, then wake the magic of my shell, and choral voices round me rise. The trembling youth, charmed by my strain, calls up the crew, who, silent, bend o'er the high deck, but list in vain. My song is hushed, my wonders end. Within the mountain's woody bay, where the tall bark at anchor rides at twilight hour with tritons gay, I dance upon the lapsing tides, and with my sister nymphs I sport, till the broad sun looks o'er the floods, then swift we seek our crystal court deep in the wave mid Neptune's woods. In cool arcades and glassy halls, we pass the sultry hours of noon, beyond wherever sunbeam falls, weaving sea flowers in gay festoon, the while we chant our ditties sweet to some soft shell that warbles near, joined by the murmuring currents fleet that glide along our halls so clear. There the pale pearl and sapphire blue and ruby red an emerald green dart from the domes a changing hue, and sparry columns deck the scene. When the dark storm scowls o'er the deep, and long, long peals of thunder sound on some high cliff, my watch I keep o'er all the restless seas around. Till on the ridgy wave afar comes the lone vessel, laboring slow, spreading the white foam in the air with sail and topmast bending low. Then plunge I mid the ocean's roar, my way by quivering lightnings shone to guide the bark to peaceful shore and hush the sailor's fearful groan. And if too late I reach its side to save it from the whelming surge, I call my dolphins o'er the tide to bear the crew where isles emerge. Their mournful spirits soon I cheer, while round the desert coast I go with warbled songs they faintly hear, oft as the stormy gust sinks low. My music leads to lofty groves that wild upon the sea bank wave, where sweet fruits bloom and fresh spring roves, and closing boughs the tempest brave. Then from the air spirits obey my potent voice they love so well, and on the clouds paint visions gay, while strains more sweet at distance swell. And thus the lonely hours I cheat, soothing the shipwrecked sailor's heart, till the waves from storms retreat, and o'er the east the day beams dart. 
Neptune, for this oft binds me fast to rocks below with coral chain, till all the tempest o'er past and drowning seamen cry in vain. Whoe'er ye are that love my lay, come, when red sunset tints the wave to the still sands where the fairies play, there in cool seas I love to lave. End of Volume 2, Chapter 2, Reading and Musical Selections Performed by Kara Dahl-Russell.